Okay, friends, uh, we'll start the second lecture today. It's 2.30 now. And uh, just to give you a brief of whatever we talked yesterday, we, we basically showed different types of telescopes and started giving definitions of uh, magnitudes and uh, magnification. And then we moved on to black body radiation and its consequence uh, to astronomy. And we upon touched upon the three special cases of black body radiation and where it directly impacts the astronomical observation. So today's talk, I will start sharing my screen. Uh, will be basically on uh, on photometers. So the main topic given by the organizer is photometry and spectroscopy. So I will be talking a little bit about images and imaging. And then I will go into what is a photometer. That means how do you measure the data from stars and galaxies. And then we move on to spectro spectrometers then how do we combine uh, telescope and an instrument like spectrometer? Then we'll talk a little bit about basics of spectroscopy, spectral lines, then describe some spectrometers which are there with the telescopes and how to reduce the data of spectroscopy. And finally, like I promised yesterday, I will be giving more information about the books and the references. So that's the plan today. Uh, first thing is digital imaging. So as I was mentioning yesterday, photographic film and human eye were the first set of detectors, but only about uh, 40, 50 years back, the CCDs came in the, in the regime now of astronomy. And today actually, all your cell phones have CCDs. Some have even more sophisticated CMOS devices, but these are essentially digital devices, so which means if you take a picture, you can move the pixels there, go to each and every position and get the counts. So for example, in the background of my picture, which you are seeing on Zoom, there is a galaxy there. So if you take the galaxy image with a CCD and a telescope, you can store that image and later, that is post-processing, you can go to each and every X and Y position there and make measurements. The Z axis is the intensity. Of course, color is mostly uh, not real because these objects are so faint that color photography, unless it is very bright, like uh, Mars or, or Jupiter, uh, you really won't get the colors because the photons are too less to come out as colors. So what most of these beautiful pictures which you see are really uh, what you call computer generated colors. So what they do, either they will make three levels of colors and distribute them as per the intensity or make much more levels, sometimes even 256 levels of colors. Essentially, if the count, so for example, wherever my pics, uh, this cursor is there on the galaxy at this point. Suppose there are 50 counts out of total 100. So they will divide this 100 into different levels of colors and then assign them. So really speaking, these are pseudo colors as they call. Real color could be done up to some extent with very long photographic films or even with CCDs having color CCD options. But again, these are quite... Uh, quite difficult to uh, attain. In fact, all these nice color pictures which you see are more of, you know, uh, attraction. But actually, when you do scientific work on this data, color is really not important. So let's move. So this is actually a picture of a galaxy taken with a telescope, which is about eight inches, and a photographic film, Fuji Chrome. This was somewhere in... 2005, and many such pictures were taken by famous person uh, David Marlin from Australia. 
But as I said, the digital images can be processed further. Photographic film to a great limit could be pro uh, not be processed beyond uh, because the basic signal difference between dark and brightest were very little. Again, photographic film had logarithmic effect. So let me skip some of this. Yeah, so this is, uh, we are talking of photometry now. So the light from telescope enters and it is adjusted. This photometer is kept at the back end of the telescope, which I showed yesterday. The actual focus is basically at this point. So what is happening is this distance to this distance is same. This is a mirror which is kept at 45 degree position. So when you are acquiring the telescope and the star and or the galaxy, you use this eyepiece to see uh, whether it is focused. And once it is focused, you flip this mirror. That means you take this out, flip it at this axis, and let the light go further. Uh, there are some photometers have post view mirror, but this is not really uh, so important. But ultimately, there are functions here. There is a thing called Fabry lens, which integrates the light to a great extent if there are fluctuations. And then, of course, you put a filter, whether it is B, V, or R, which we discussed somewhat yesterday. And this is the detector. It could be a photomultiplier tube, it could be a solid state detector, or it could be even a CCD head. So this is one of the real photometers which have been there for many years, and some of the students doing astrophysics course are using this as an optic SSP3 photometer. You can see B and V written here, blue and V filters, they are slided in and out. And this is the eyepiece through which you will see. So once the light from star comes here, there is an inner flip mirror, which is rotated by this, it's on the side. And let the light go through this and you put your eye and focus it. And then you flip it back and let the light go further. And you can see there is, everything is very compact. There's the power switch. There are some setting buttons here. And eventually you will get the counts, digital counts here, four digits. <laughs> Uh, so, so when you close or, for example, you cap it or even in the telescope, you put a cover on the telescope main entrance, then you will get what is as a dark counts. But that will be typically uh, four or five counts. And when you open it, but there is no star, then you will get what is as a sky counts. And finally, when you acquire a star, you will get the star plus dark plus the sky. And then you can sequentially remove them and get the actual uh, data. So this, somebody was asking about transit and eclipse and these things. So this is one of the typical observations done way back in 2000 uh, from Finland. And you will notice that uh, this is a standard star next to it, preferably very close by, which is not showing any dip. There is a fluctuation because the counts are depending on the atmosphere. Fluctuations are there even on this. But you see there is a clean dip here and then again comes back, which means the star was eclipsed uh, by this exoplanet. When this exoplanet, this star might have a moon which was uh, being uh, seen. So either you will have star and then the moon comes in front of the star, the starlight comes down and again recovers. So from this, analyzing this curve, you can do many things, the size of the moon and, and various other things. Also, it is important to know that this may not be always face on. When I mean face on, suppose you can look at my hand and suppose this is the star and this is the moon of the star, which comes and crosses like this. So this is face on means it is diametrically along the diameter. But it may be just crossing by edge. So those things uh, need much more information. So it's, most of the time, they may not be actually face on uh, uh, occultation or transit. So this is the basic thing where all these discoveries are taking place of different planets coming in front of stars by bigger and bigger telescopes. So again, coming back to CCD, uh, when you want to use, so remember this instrument was a single uh, 
It's a single one-dimensional detector. That means all the light is collected and putting on this detector. Whereas, so this is where the detector is. So whether it's a galaxy or star, whatever you get, you are focusing it on a single point, one-dimensional detector. So, but when you talk of CCD, let me see if there is a picture of so anyway, CCD picture might have missed out in this talk. Um, it's a two-dimensional detector, which means this whole screen, what you see here, is as if the detector, so the pixel number zero, zero, and then you count here and on this axis. So typically, the largest CCDs can be 4,000 by 4,000, which means each position is an X and Y position. You can take the cursor like this cursor, and you can check the counts there. And essentially what you do, you reconstruct this image on your screen. That is essentially what uh, digital imaging uh, is, is done. But there are more details about CCD, which I'm not going to cover in this. But the only good thing about CCD is they can come as close as better than 90% in efficiency. When I say efficiency, I'm referring to quantum efficiency. So what is quantum efficiency? It's a simple concept. Suppose uh, let me say I am sitting here and this side the light is entering, say 100 photons come and my face is the detector and this side I get 100. So what is the efficiency? 100%. So most of the human eye or photographic films are very poor efficiency. They are only a few percent, not even, even sometimes less than 1%. Then you had photomultiplier tubes which are also not used anymore now because of CCDs. So photomultiplier tubes typically have an efficiency of about 10, 20 percent maximum. Then came the era of CCDs, which really was a breakthrough, not just for normal physics experiments, but for astronomy particularly. Because CCDs could go to efficiencies as high as 90 percent in the visible band. Of course, CCD is a solid state device based on silicon. So silicon band gap will matter. So it's a solid state physics there, uh, which means the silicon has a device which has a band gap of uh, uh, 1.2 electron volt and you can convert and see, you know, H mu by lambda is electron volts. So you can tell what is the cutoff frequency. Typically, CCDs can go up to one micron uh, deep in the red, beyond red. And on the ultraviolet side, of course, they can observe, but uh, you will have to put a coating to make it useful for optical uh, uh, visible band. Visible is okay, but blue band. So CCDs in the red, particularly around 7,000 angstroms in the red, they can be extremely efficient, as high as 95%. So that's a very big boon because now what I was giving the example of quantum efficiency, if 100 photons come to this CCD, you will detect almost 95 of them. Which means you reverse the whole issue, then in astronomy, it's very demanding. So it can go to very, very faint objects and without losing, only losing about 5% of the photons. So this is the picture which was shown yesterday, but now I am showing in a slightly bigger uh, screen. So this is the ultraviolet band the blue light, and you can see in the background, I've put the colors also. This is the visible yellow, green, the solar light, very eye is sensitive. This is the R, which is near 7,000. And this is I band, the next to R. And this is a typical hot star with absorption features here. Uh, for example, the H alpha line is 65636. Yeah, these are H beta and, and H gamma and so on. And you can see this curve, the envelope is almost like a black body. But if the star is very hot, then most of these absorption features will not be there, which means most of the materials have escaped except hydrogen. Whereas if the star is cooler, not only this peak will shift towards this red region, but that will have many, many such absorption lines. So that's how a stellar spectrum looks. Um, this we talked yesterday, but now I will go a little more in details. Uh, so this has a lot of information, this curve, and you won't easily see it in books. That's why I've overwritten with hand many things. So when I said B, V, and R, these are the main three filters, let us say. So B band is from 4,000 to 5,000, which is the blue region. Then visible is 5,000 to 6,000. And R, 
the red band is 6,000 to 7,000. And what are the peak wavelengths here? 4,500 for blue, 55 for green, uh, or yellow green visible, and 6,500 for red. And they are shown here with this hash, um, put these hashes perfect, purposely. So when I say it's B, you can barely see this error bar here. So I'm integrating the light of this, take any star or any black body, say the higher, the hottest one here. So the band is going from 4,000 to 5,000. So that is this. And you can see that is the kind of averaging you are doing. Because you will be measuring here, here, and here, three places at the middle of the bands with these filters. They are actually color glasses rather because they are quite broad. So the error bar, when I say here, and this side is the intensity, okay? So what is the intensity error? Firstly, you are averaging on the x-axis, which is the uh, wavelength band, okay? Which I already shown. And this axis, the averaging is the fluctuation. And I should tell you, others will also mention this. Uh, photons, when they come from a distant star or for that matter, in any natural sources, they follow what is called as Poisson distribution, which means suppose 100 photons are coming every second, then that 100 is continuously fluctuating, which means at this instant, if I take a count, it could be 99. The next second, it could be 94. The next one could be 103. It is continuously fluctuating within plus minus square root of the mean value, which is 100. This, is, this can be proved, but uh, that's a very important thing. And that also helps in improving many things. We will see later how it improves. So essentially, this error bar on y-axis is the photon statistics. So there are two error bars coming in this. And that is your general error bar here. On x-axis, you have the uh, averaging issue and y-axis is the intensity fluctuation. So with this, uh, what happens is you you will be making three measurements, essentially. Um, I think I will go to this so that, yeah, it's better. Okay. So now, we are slowly moving into spectra. Now, the, what you see now is a nice with your colors, continuous change of colors. That's why it is called continuous. And this is what you see from a tungsten bulb, which will be soon going out of fashion. Most of you have seen LED bulbs or tube lights and so on. So you still have the tungsten bulbs in your two wheelers or four wheelers. They are also eventually going into LEDs, very bright LEDs. So essentially what is happening is uh, you have a source and you see the colors. So let me just, just hold on for a minute. Yeah. So you will see very soon uh, that this is what I'm trying to show uh, related to astronomy. So this is my continuous source, which could be a lamp, you know, like a tungsten bulb. So this is a source as if this is the star, which is the hot star inside, uh, which has nucleus, nuclear processes going on. And if you directly see the star with no atmosphere, you will see the continuum spectra, which I showed just now. But suppose there are star, which all the stars, unless it's a very, very hot star, very thin atmosphere, you will have atmosphere and the light will pass through this atmosphere. And it will show these absorption dips. So these are the black lines because they are the absorption dips. And of course, if this gas is hot enough, and it itself starts emitting, then you will have emission lines. So I can give you examples of both these things uh, in, in the following way. So everybody in your home or wherever you are, you have seen a tube light, right? So what is happening inside a tube light? There is mercury vapor. And at the ends, they have a filament, which is when you connect to the power, it starts the discharge and it heats up the mercury vapor and the mercury vapor starts going into transition. And that's why the mercury uh, provides uh, a spectrum, which we will see much later, uh, which will look like an emission spectrum like this. But this darkness in between will not be there because mercury also has a 
in our must continue. So, so the mercury spectra will be quite bad. It will be full of uh, lights inside. Whereas, if it is a much, uh, it's a gas like uh, sodium lamp. So many cities have sodium lamps in the night. You can try in your on your street. You will have sodium lamps which are yellow. So they have only sodium lines and rest. Although it is neon, but it is suppressed high. So it is just two lines of sodium and the rest is mostly dark. So, so these are the examples. This is the continuum spectra. This is emission spectra. And you can see this is bright green line of mercury here. And there are other lines also, some in the violet side. And this is the same thing with absorption. So you can see at the same, exactly the same position. I want to move my cursor in. You can see the slight shift in my processing of the image. So they are exactly at the same way. So what we do now, so this is a basic spectrometer and it is coupled to a telescope. So what is the telescope? I'm taking it as a D. D is the diameter of the primary mirror or, or even the objective lens, doesn't matter. So this is the telescope and it focuses here. Here I have a slit and then I make it again with two lenses. So two lenses, a parallel section of the light. So one thing to be borne in mind right from here is whatever you are using to disperse this light into spectrum, which will be defined as dispersor, has to be in the parallel section. So we make artificially a parallel section inside the instrument with two lenses. So this is the collimator, which collimates into the parallel beam. And this is the camera lens, which means the parallel beam is again refocused onto a detector. So why you have seen, you are seeing it in color because the spectrum is formed here blue to red. Okay, and uh, this detector could be in olden times with this photographic film. You could actually even tilt this grating and just have one slit here, then you will see different colors as the spectrum moves from here to here. Uh, I can see one chat. So it's the question from Abhijit is, uh, how do we see absorption spectra if that part of the spectrum is absorbed? So it's, it's a good question, but also not very good for a simple reason. Because it is absorbed, that's why you see the dark light. So I will go back here. And sorry. So that's why at the same place, since the emission doesn't take place, it rather absorbs, you see a dark light. Of course, this dark means there will be a dip there. It may not be fully zero, depending on how much material is there. So, so actually from studying these lines, from stars, you can actually make out how much is the material of that particular element. In this case, it is mercury, but it could be hydrogen. How much hydrogen is there in your line of sight? So I have uh, kind of partially answered this question, but yes, it will. it is absorbed, that's why it becomes dark. Okay, so in this, we have seen that the spectrum forms on this detector, okay? And now here, what is happening is, I told you that there is a slit here on which the image is formed. But I also told you the star is continuously dancing. Why? Because of the atmospheric turbulence. If you go to space, of course, this problem will not begin. You will have a nice steady uh, point source here. But what is actually happening on Earth is you, the starlight is distributed into this pattern. In fact, sometimes the star is here, here, here. So every 10 milliseconds it is dancing around. So overall diameter is about two to three arc seconds, depending on the place you are. And when you put a slit, you are only taking some part of the slides. You are already losing a lot of it. In fact, that's why you have to optimize the observation in such a way that the slit is wide enough to take all this light. But as soon as you make the slit wide enough, what happens? Your resolution goes down. And we will, we will see that very soon, how the slit width depends on the resolution. Resolution means the spectral resolution. This is not the spatial resolution. And then, you do all this, the grating and all that, and finally you have the spectrum. So you see how the spectrum looks from this uh, dancing star, red and up to blue. The, the, the light is distributed now into different colors. Remember, it is the same number. So suppose there are 100 photons. If there are three such colors, I would have divided 100 into 33, 33, 33, roughly. Right? But not exactly equal because the efficiency also comes. Okay.
So now we will, just like yesterday's definitions, I will now start defining about spectral resolution. So what is spectral resolution? R lambda by delta lambda. Here, R is, is actually a ratio. And lambda, for example, we take visible band. And I, I mentioned, let me go back. Yeah, you see, when I say V band, it is 5500, is the central wavelength. So R is lambda by delta lambda. And what is delta lambda? 1000 max stops. Which means this will be 5000 or 5500 angstroms divided by 1000. So it is 5.5. So R is 5.5. And most of the photometry is actually broadband spectroscopy, right? So you can call it low resolution spectroscopy. So it is less than 10. And the, the sampling on the spectrum is 1000 angstroms because the bandwidth of the filter is 1000 angstroms. Next stage is R more than 10, but up to 100. So this is called low resolution spectroscopy, or some people can call it, people doing photometry will call it narrow band photometry. So now R is up to 100. Then comes medium resolution spectroscopy. Now R is between 100 and 10,000. And very soon see that these were creating cells. And higher resolution is a different domain, it is beyond 10,000. But remember in all this game, it is the same. Always remember my example, there are 100 photons have come. Whether you do this, 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 you are dividing the same line into smaller and smaller bits. So per bin, remember per bin, the photons are reducing. Which means your sensibility of a detector has to shoot up. Otherwise you can't detect, you know, if you are detecting 100 photons in a wide band, and if you want to detect the same 100 photons in a small band, then either the telescope has to collect much more photons, which means larger telescopes are very useful for high resolution spectroscopy. So these are entangled things and it will become further clear as we go on. So this is a slide which, uh, this and a couple of few more slides after this, uh, you won't easily find in books, although I will give the references, but these were thoroughly done when I was doing my PhD almost 35, 40 years back. So this material is from that and it's it's written in a very easy way so we can appreciate the, the thing. So in this case, uh, this was a French astronomer and optician called Jacquino who defined this thing, L plus R is constant. That's why I've made it as a bold. And since he was French, there was a lot of confusion between the translation of his books from French to English. So attendue is a French word which is essentially the total output of anything. And again, you see, I warned you last lecture yesterday that luminosity, so here the luminosity is coming in a different domain. It's not the luminosity of the star. This is the luminosity of the actual instrument. Or, I tend to the correct translation is throughput in English. And this is in the units of centimeter square, but steradian is a solid angle. And L, if I define this as L, it is the solid angle omega into area of the spectrometer. When I say area, this is the accepting light uh, at the spectrometer, not at the telescope. And this is a constant. That's what he, he proved actually. And later, of course, it has been appreciated, which means that this is a constant. So either you improve the resolution, that means this R will become higher and higher, but then L will also come down to keep this constant steady. But interestingly, in my next few slides, you will see this itself changes from a prism to grating to a very high resolution instrument. That's why it becomes very interesting. So I just simplified to omega into R. And now suppose you want to compare a grating with a fabric or I will briefly mention these instruments not going with too much deep. When you take a comparison of this L cross R, you will see by putting the actual numbers, when I say actual number, a typical grating can be as large as five centimeter, and uh, fabric pillow can be about, uh, you know, uh, about 100 millimeters or something. So you will still get a gain of 100. So this means that fabric pillow intrinsically is an instrument which is much better performing in terms of throughput compared to grating. But again, remember, this is not a general rule. This is a specific rule. 
when you're working on a spectral line. Again, many of these things will become uh, easier in the next few slides. So again, I have defined here omega and you can skip this. But yeah, this is the sentence, these two sentences. So I was mentioning everybody has done uh, spectroscopy experiments in your BSc, maybe now there's even in school, where you have a sodium lamp and you have a slit width and you, you start seeing the sodium lines. Uh, but if you increase the slit width, you will not decipher them as two lines. Whereas if you reduce the slit width, you will start seeing the two lines. So which means including slit width, more light is accepted, but resolution goes down. And the reverse, uh, if you decrease the slit width, less light is accepted, but resolution goes up. So this is where the Jacquinot principle comes. For the same resolution, they can accept more light or they are more luminous. So that was, of course, French translation. They can give more through. So let's see if I move next. Okay, so this is again a comparison which won't see in any books. If you have A and R, A is the area of the spectrometer and the resolution comparable, then you will see that for, for Vivero, the output is much larger. Similarly, if you make A and L similar, then Vivero will give you much higher resolution. And the last one is very important, considering what we talked yesterday. If these two are made comparable, then you read a very small instrument so that you don't let load the back end of the telescope. We saw a similar picture yesterday, but this is for spectral lines. There are two spectral lines. They are well separated by Rayleigh criteria, provided this cross-section point is 80% of these two things. But this doesn't mean that you can't resolve a spectral line with a small kink here, because by definition of this, you can't resolve, but you can still see the uh, small line at the side. And this will be very useful when you see uh, a cloud in the sky, Orion, Nebula, where there are inter-cloud motions. Those will be showing up as small kinks. Now we will be comparing different categories, that is low resolution, high, a medium, and high. So this is again a table which won't, you won't find it. Uh, so lowest is prism. And many of you remember reading basic optics books where Newton is sitting with a prism and the sunlight is coming in his room from a point and he sees the nice spectrum uh, projected on the wall. So that's a continuous spectrum he's seeing and he's using prism, which is a low institute, resolution instrument and uses the fraction principle. Uh, for the moment, forget this. So it can be used from ultraviolet 2000 angstroms to infrared to 40 microns. Of course, in infrared, it won't be glass. It will be some crystal. And they come in the low R less than 500. I defined the resolution a little while ago. Grating comes in the next. Here, the principle is diffraction. And you are about to uh, use about uh, you know 10,000 or so uh, beams. And it can go from X-rays to microwave. And now we are in the region of 500 to 10,000. And high resolution, you have two instruments, Fabricaro and Fourier Transform. They are based on interference. Now the number of beams are much less. And these can go from ultraviolet to sub-millimeter. And now R is much more than 10 to the power 4. In fact, some of the high resolution gratings can be used up to 10 to the power 4, but that is the kind of limit for them. So, uh, this is the another part of the table. Now, if the resolution attained, this refers to the L cross R, which I was saying. For prism, if suppose you gain a value of R, then this is the same word throughput. For the same resolution, prism is the worst category. And next is grating, which is better. And of course, this is best, the high resolution instrument. And you see the L cross R, if it is something here, then it is 10 to 50 times better for grating. And this is more than 200 to 500 times better than prism. The problem comes in the last column. Like I said, Newton saw the spectrum and it was unambiguous. There was no confusion. There was a nice single spectrum 
uh, seen on the wall. The next category is grating where you start overlapping these spectrum and you will have to sort them out. And then here in the last category of high resolution, you don't even see the spectrum at all. So you have to do either deconvolution or inverse for your transform. Now, both these methods 30, 40 years back were limited by the computers because computers were much slower. Although these methods were there analytically possible, but computers are extremely slow. But now, of course, we have fast Fourier transforms and other tools. So these are no more a limitation. But the only limitation is you don't have the spectrum recovery in real time. You have to post-process to get the spectrum. Uh, let me skip this. Okay. Now, I talked about the mercury line 5461, green line in mercury or the sodium D1, D2, 2 lines, 5890 and 5896. These are the spectral lines in emission from these lamps. So in astrophysics also, for example, the Oran Nebula, <coughs> Oran Nebula is, is a gas, it's a very thin gas, and it is radiating at oxygen 3, that's the third ionization of oxygen, at 5007 angstrom. 5007 is also a green color. And in fact, some of you have seen a telescope and ran in the January when it is almost over it. You will see beautiful picture of Orion. And if your eyes are good enough, just with Orion, you can do this. You can't do this with other objects, which are much fainter. The eye can just barely see the colors and you can see spectacular green colors there. Uh, but of course, if you take an image, you can see them much better. So this 5007 is a line of oxygen. So what is this spectral line? That is what we are defining. So there are the spectral line forms of these different things that is happening in nature. Some of them are happening in the astrophysical situation. Some of them is happening right here in your home in the tube light and so on. So we'll go one by one. Firstly, the definition of the width of the line. So when I'm saying I am, this is the line. So this is the absorption line. It doesn't matter. It can be an emission line like mercury line here. Exactly mirror image on this side. So what I've done, uh, there is a question in the chat. So they are asking, this treaty Shukla is asking questions in advance. So you have to hold on. I have not yet come to that. She is asking thermal broadening is same as pressure broadening. Uh, so let me come to that stage. So this is the absorption line. A very similar one is in the emission line. Now if we take, so this is the baseline where the spectrum started. And if I integrate this, in a few years back, when the computers were not so easy for the students, I actually used to give graph sheet to the students and ask them to count all the squares and get the integrated area under the sky. Even today you can do it by some computer tool. So essentially, area of this line, under this line, is an equivalent rectangle, which is shown here as a shaded line. And this is called the equivalent width, W lambda. So the spectral line will have an equivalent width always. Okay, so uh, let's see. So that is what I have explained. And what is happening in a spectral line, there are various things happening. I mean, I listed four of them here. Uh, most important is the, this, this, and this you will see directly. This will happen only in some laboratory cases because in, in astrophysics situation, the, the, the space there is so thin that there is almost no pressure. But it can happen under very high pressure atmosphere in some situation, but not so much in, in astrophysics. But yes, in the laboratory pressure burning does take place and People in physics laboratories have seen it. So here, this is what I was showing. Now, this is not to the scale. For example, the y-axis is not to the scale. But you can see this out of fortunate. Unfortunately, this is not in color. Otherwise, you will appreciate. So this curve, I am following it, is a Lorentz curve, which is not falling to zero, right? Even at infinity form. This is falling much faster, this outer curve. And that is Gaussian shape. So everybody knows what is Gaussian shape. It is e to the power a square x square, where x is for the x-axis. 
So this is the central wavelength, lambda zero, and these are the two edges. And the equivalent width me measurement is half of this height, okay? Now, this is shown for comparison. But what is happening is the spectral line has these things all inside. In the, so let's always take an example of, uh, say, Mercury green line. These two things are happening simultaneously. So firstly, what is happening? Transition, how does it take from energy? E2 to E1, and you have H mu coming back. And the whole process is governed by uncertainty principle. Again, I'm not going into the basics of atomic physics, but essentially these levels are not sharp as shown. In fact, they, are, they have uh, uncertainties here. And that's why this line will have plus minus delta D. And that is what is called the natural body. So natural body comes from this transition. So an atom, when it is sitting at a higher level, it takes some while to come to the ground state. And typically in astrophysical cases, it is nanoseconds, uh, nanoseconds to microseconds. So one by two pi tau, and that is, so one by time is frequency. You will get the delta nu, which I mentioned here. So convert that, a red line will have Point zero, so, so these numbers are important. This is very small, milli angstroms, 0, 0, 002 angstrom, which means this Laurentian shape, the width here is 0, 0, 002. So this is, as I said, not to the scale. Gaussian will be actually much broader. I don't have a blackboard here, otherwise I could have drawn it. But anyway, so this is milli angstroms, and this is Laurentian shape. And this can be actually proved, and this comes uh, from the uncertainty principle. The next broadening effect is Doppler effect. Again, one book uh, which will be there on my last slide today is a book by Thorne, one British lady author, uh, written uh, by her some years back. It's called Spectrophysics. A new edition has come. It's a beautiful book where most of these things with minimal mathematics is explained. In fact, I should not, uh, uh, what I should say, I should not. Uh, uh, during my PhD days, actually, I read that book overnight. You know, it was such a nice, like a novel. So I can only, I'm not boasting, you should read this book. I think it is available in Softwatch and also. And uh, some of these books can be actually read through IUCA's library. So you can request the organizer uh, to, to do this. They will give you the links of some of most of these books because they are used in the MSC here. They are available in online also. Okay, so this is very nicely showing. So again, take the example of tube light. Now, this is you are looking at the tube light. Tube light is here. When I say tube light, the mercury atoms inside the tube. Now they are randomly moving. Anything which is random, what is the curve? It is a Gaussian curve. Any random process will result into a Gaussian curve, which is shown here. Now, in different colors, some uh, mercury atom is coming towards you. Some is going laterally, so there won't be any Doppler shift. Now, again, I should tell you, there is a very subtle difference between Doppler shift and Doppler burden. The whole effect is called Doppler effect. I will explain that just now. Let me go to the chat. Somebody is asking a question. Um, Okay, I will come back to the chat window later. So, uh, now these atoms are moving randomly inside the tube, right? And essentially each one is one point here. So you form the spectral line here. And this width is coming from this uh, effect of Doppler work. So what is Doppler effect? Is a combine of shift and burden. So you have heard this, you know, car uh, horn or a railway engine's whistle coming, approaching and going away. So that is essentially uh, the Doppler effect. So when you see broadening, it's the broadening of the spectral line itself. And the line is also shifting if you are actually moving it. So suppose you are holding a tube light and move with a speed uh, very high, so V by C. So V has to be much higher. Then you will also see the, see the 5461 line shifting in addition to the 
width, which is intrinsic, because it is that everybody has experienced touching a tube light, it's slightly warm. So you see, uh, that will give you the temperature. So the width of this line is directly related to the temperature. This is the formula. I won't go into too much details here, but essentially now this number is important. This can be derived in the in the Thorne's book. It is nicely derived in half, half a page derivation from Boltzmann statistics and Gaussian principle. So sun, 5700 degree Kelvin. You see the width of that line is not zero three. So remember that was milli angstrom and this is one order broader. And this is Gottschalk. This doesn't happen so much in the lab. You need a lot of high magnetic field to split a line into. This is Zeeman effect. And, but it's very common in, in stars, particularly uh, where stars can have, just like sunspot stars can have very large spots and the magnetic field can be extremely high. In fact, the most uh, highest magnetic field ever seen uh, is called the Barnard star, which has uh, an, up to 30 kilogauss. I can tell you quickly what is Gauss, you should know. Uh, one Gauss is the average magnetic field over the sun's surface. Of course, not at the spots, the spots, the magnetic field is much higher. For example, the Barnard star has 30 kilogauss, 30,000 Gauss, it's a huge magnetic field. And on Earth, on an average, we have half a boss. So with this Landage factor and this formula, now you see the splitting. That is, so now what is happening? This line has a Doppler shift. In addition, it has a Doppler width. And when you put additional magnetic field around it, it will split into three. Actually, not three. It's just showing like that. Uh, you will see only these two. Okay. So that was the another effect. And then rotational back. This is happening in many cases. In fact, what is happening? The star spot with the star rotating, the star spot will have a rotation. So if there is a spectrum coming out from the star, it will, so you can look at my hand on the screen, the spectrum is like this. If there are two objects, and for example, an occultation is taking place, the star spectrum, or even two stars, you know, one could be a hot, one could be a cooler star, and they are moving around each other. So the spectrum, when two of them are coinciding as this, and then they will do this. And notice my hand. So what happens, this splitting will be continuously moving on either side. And with that, you can measure the rotation. Because this is again a rotational broadening. So again, the Doppler effect of shift is coming. Here already the broadening is intrinsic to the line. In addition, because of the two objects, uh, they will be shifting going on. Now, I have come at a stage where I will be briefly describing in the remaining time some spectroscometers. But since this PDF file will be shared in the evening, including the yesterday's, you can go through this uh, in a great detail. Uh, I will take the chat questions after the lecture uh, gets over in another few minutes. So this is the typical example. As I said, the grating moves. There are two meters, the light source here is shown like a candle and detector has the spectrum. So we'll quickly go through the de uh, definition disperser, as I said, this is the disperser, which disperses this light into different wavelengths. Measure, the dispersion is measure of spreading. Angular dispersion. So this is resulting the dispersion in different angles which is d theta by d lambda. Now, since you are taking the image on this, uh, let me catch that spectrum. So, again, somebody, people are very inquisitive and impatient. Arpita is asking the book. So I don't want to share it on chat books. I will be giving it on the slide in the last slide. Then Purvi is asking, is the width of spectral absorption line due to the rotational broadening limited or we can you know, widespread of lines with just rotation. So it's a uh, question is not uh, very clear, but partially I can say that what she's asking is rotational broadening and absorption are they related? So absorption line will be seen otherwise also. But uh, when you when you see the shift in the lines, this is the effect of two stars moving around each other. Even with a single star, if it is rotating very fast, if you can take the spectrum 
of a particular point of this is only happening in the modern technology where a star spot can be tracked and then you can see the rotation of the star so there are various uh, aspects of this somebody is asking when will you shape the pdf while i just mentioned it will be given by the organizer in the evening so you have to check it out okay i will not take any more chat questions right now and then so i was here at linear dispersion so now here it is each bin or each centimeter is lambda 1 to lambda 2 right you are covering one wavelength from the blue side to the red side so sorry so that's why linear dispersion and f why is f is coming because i am using a camera here it's a camera mirror or a camera lens reciprocal is more useful because nanometer because what you are ultimately interested in every millimeter corresponds to how much angstroms one nanometer is 10 angstroms i already told you so different kinds of gratings are used gratings have a property of blazing which means the light is coming at a very so this is so grating is basically uh, a diamond cutter which has removed uh, on the glass and produce such steps and they are coated with uh, silver or aluminum to make it reflect so the light comes here and this is sin i by sin r it as simple as that so this is just pure reflection but making it narrow this cone uh, improve the efficiency in a particular band so this is again going into too much of details but i will not uh, so the another a book for this will be uh, also in the list which i will be sh uh, sharing with you uh let me skip some of the higher details yes so you can see in this nice picture sun spectrum from red to the other side ultraviolet uh, almost violet is split into different parts because the sun spectra is so big Uh, with this high dispersion instrument, that in one so this is the CCD frame, it's probably thousand angstroms by two thousand angstroms, and you can actually read just the red spectrum here and the next one, and you can see very fine dark absorption lines. So somebody was asking, this is the actual absorption lines in the sun, which is a G-type star, and these are the dips where those specific elements of gases are there in the star. uh let's see how much time i don't have really much time but this is a quick example uh, where if you are asked to design a grating for a telescope then you will have to go via this procedure so you have to find the reciprocal linear distribution and what the actual resolution you get for a 25 micron scale this is a very simple example i have given the wavelength blaze is 500 in the in the green region the width of the grating is 2 inches 50 mm and uh, there is an order and the focal length is 1/4 meter and so on and this calculation essentially uh, what it shows that the theoretically you can say you are in the uh, better than 10000 resolution for grating but actually you don't attain it because of a lot of dispersion and other things happening and what you actually get is 1/10th of that about 6000 and how to do that You shine a laser to the instrument, and laser is also infinitely small. It's like a delta function. So what you will get will be the effect of the actual instrument, which is measured, and they measure it at zero nine, which is point one angstroms. Ah, uh, let me skip many of these things. So I just show you some nice pictures. So this is an instrument, which is a veteran instrument. Why I say veteran? Anybody who has done spectroscopy with stars. the last 20 30 years would have used this this is an instrument at arizona uh, on the top of a mountain about 2000 meters and it's called kudai field telescope the telescope diameter uh, is about 0.9 meter so that is the telescope mirror the light come from star is of course cloudy light here and comes here in another mirror and then enters this is all happening at the terrace right and you are not supposed to go there Unless you are a technician, it's all protected. This is in US, so you will sue them if you fall down. So that's why they have taken precaution. Then the light comes from star, comes here, then enters this roof and enters to the next floor where the light comes from terrace. Enters. This is the dispersion system where you have spectral lamps and so on. 
and then goes to another level below, which is a huge hall where there is a grating. This is the huge grating, and this was a unique instrument. Even today, it's it's up, but uh, because of fund shortages, they have closed it. And you can see there is a bit of uh, you can barely see some uh, uh, smoke coming out. So this is the detector, the CCD detector, and it is cooled by liquid nitrogen. The instrument is huge, you know, it has a 3000 by 1000 uh, size grating. And we used for almost, you know, six, seven years, me and my colleague from Delhi University, Professor Singh, and uh, the US counterpart under an Indo US program. And this is the kind of spectra, very high resolution we got. Uh, this calls Kude Feed Library. We observed some 1200 stars. And all the way from blue to red. And you can see this is the actual spectrum all the way from 3500 to uh, almost 9000. It looks like a noise, you know. And this is a K-type star, this particular star. And since this is K-type star, the peak is somewhere in the uh, yellow region. Mm -hmm. This is red. And each of this small part, if you expand, this is a real spectrum. And you can study these absorption features for that particular gas and so on. Um, what I will do is, rather than telling you more about the high-resolution instruments, because not much time, this, everybody is familiar with Newton rings experiment. It is very similar to this. You actually use two glass plates, which are made perfectly parallel, and allow the light to come like this. So these are the two perfectly parallel plates. Again, this was, uh, in fact, in France, they call it Perot Fabry, because Fabry was British, and Perot was French. This is the Fabry Perot alarm, and the light, from extended source, which is galaxy or something, will get multiple reflected and only constructively interfere and form these rings here. Because that was the ring pattern which you see. Uh, again, there are questions. Let's see. Now, one question asked by Anushka is again a black hole question, which I definitely will not answer. Uh, is asking uh, when you see a dark line dip. So I told you already the absorption features are dark line. Uh, burning star, all stars are burning stars. So why do you take this absorption so you know, a collapsing star or a black hole instead of currently burning star? What changes will be observed in the absorption spectrum? You completely black reading because of complete absorption. So physics wise, the question is correct. If you have complete absorption, it will be dark. But there is never a complete absorption. As I said, the number of uh, that particular molecule in your line of sight will matter to that. Uh, two mirrors in could instead of directly allowing light to fall on the telescope. Why two mirrors? I partially explained yesterday because you need to the light to come out from side to go to a much bigger room where the spectrograph will be. So I think I'll stop taking questions now. Okay. Uh, so I will not go into too much detail about the instrument, but February, Baro, as I said, are two mirrors placed at a distance of D, and you can get very high resolution spectrum. So this was very useful. This instrument was my prime PhD instrument, which I developed for astronomy. And you can take an example. When we studied Orion Nebula, we could get these fringes for a particular line. The line I said was 5007. So if you move the telescope to different parts of Orion, these fringes will also move and you will not see light everywhere because wherever there is a bright part. So suppose this is the nebula is a shape of ellipse here. The rest of the part will be all dark, only the ellipsial parts will have these fringes. So you analyze this and measure the width of this line by Doppler effect and get the temperature of the 5007 line. And also any shift in this will tell you, the general shift will tell the Orion is moving away or approaching you, blue or red shift, and any minor uh, changes in this will be that particular region of Orion as shifts of wavelengths or sh uh, changes in velocities within the Orion. So I think uh, time is not enough to cover this, but this was this is just to show you how a February on looks and in a highly polished glass. So you can see from the side. And what is interesting is these two glass pieces are. Uh, contacted each other with what is called as optical contact. They are perfectly parallel. They are parallel to a level of lambda by 10,000. 
and they are so sturdy that even if you kick this table, the fringe pattern which I showed the neutron rings kind of thing will never change because they will automatically uh, feedback control it. This is a closer view of a tuner than a tuner. Um, just to run through, when you are going to a telescope, but previous day you have to know what objects you will observe, whether their positions are available to you at your observatory. Then you have to get a standard stars, which are not changing. And you should have brighter, fainter, all kinds of, and also different spectral types, because if your unknown star is a red type and you are using a blue type star as standard, that's not good, because you will get very different values of counts. And of course, the grating settings have to be decided which part of the spectrum you want to. And to calibrate the x-axis, you need a spectral lab. So I'll show quickly some uh, pictures of the actual observation. So, so this is actually uh, a lamp spectrum. You can see many, many lamps. This is a helium neon lamp. The neon lines are flooding. This is black and white, of course. And you have to calibrate the x-axis. What is this wave? So for that, this is a continuum lamp. Uh, just uh, like a tungsten bulb inside the dome, what they do, they have a white screen, like a projector screen, and take the thing, and you will see this side is dark, this side is bright, and this is the CCD. And this is blue side, this is red side. So the answer is obvious. The red side of the CCD is more sensitive, so it is taking more photons, and that's why it's brighter. Blue side is less. So you have to make it uniform, which means if this is a function, it's a curve, you have to use, invert it, to make it uniform. And that is what you do in the process. This is a standard star. Now you can barely see some dips here. This is this is probably the H beta line, H alpha line. This is a, a bright standard star which are observed and the starlight is just along one line or few pixels on the system. This is the same CC. And this is the actual supernova spectra. And you can see these fainter lines are the sky as air glow lines which are uh, overlapping here. In fact, these lines can also allow you to take the wavelength scale because many times in the supernova or some cases we don't even know the object is at what radial velocity. In fact, the whole red spectrum may be shifted to blue or, or on the other side depending on whether it's approaching or So that is a big challenge. So you have to have calibration lines. This is a picture where those neon lines you can, you can barely see the wavelengths have been calibrated of these neon lines in the range of uh, almost 6,000 to 10,000 angstroms. And this is that curve I was telling, the sensitivity curve. And this side is more sensitive, this side is less. So you reverse this or divide all the data with this function to get the correct data. So this is an actual spectra of a hot star. And you can see these absorption features I was mentioning. Uh, H alpha is barely seen here. And these are the H beta, H gamma other lines. And this spectrum has been calibrated on Y axis. This has been observed by many, many other telescopes. And now that you know the flux in absolute units, you can calibrate your measurement with another telescope's measurement. So then whatever you uh, report after this will be appreciated by others because you have calibrated the Y axis with the other telescope. So this is the actual spectra of the supernova. It's complicated. So I'm now a supernova person, but it has come on this 4,000 to 6,500 wavelength scale. So this is the last slide many of you were asking. So I'll just briefly tell you this first book, Kitchen, is a book uh, which talks about spectroscopy. There is another book by the same author, Astronomical Telescopes, which talk about very basic, probably BSc or even school level. This is another book which has much more technical details about spectroscopy. This is the book I was mentioning, AP Thorne on Spectrophysics. This is on February. This is the books I will strongly, uh, this has several editions. I don't know whether there is a later edition than this. This book is by Ian McLean. And the name doesn't even sound like it talks about all whatever I was talking. But most of my material you will find here. And it's a very good book. It talks about CCDs, it's about spectroscopy, and all various things. This is about spectral classification. We talked about hot stars and cold stars. Uh, again, I'm not promoting, but this is a book which is available. Uh, soft copies available through iColabin. This is an igloo book, 
The whole idea of if you book was written by many authors, including me, some chapters, where the idea is that it is without a teacher, the student can understand, solve the problem. So it's a very good book, and I think you can even buy the hard copy from Delhi from Hindu Publishing. I think a couple of hundred rupees, but otherwise it's available on soft copy. So with that, I will be closing uh, my uh, what you call the talk today, and let me stop sharing the screen. and let me take some questions so somebody the purvi has again has observed we have been saying it has to be increased does one comprise the resolution this is a very good question by purvi and of course she could have got the answer herself the question is in simple terms if you want to increase the coverage of wavelength from red to blue what do you want to do at the same time you want high resolution the only quick answer to that is use fabric pro Uh, sorry, you use a Fourier transform, which is a wide spectrum and high resolution, but there is a limitation. And as I said, the spectrum is not easily available. A lot of computation is involved. Rather, what we do, just like the solar spectrum I saw, you take an SL grating, which is a high resolution, and you take parts of the spectrum onto the sheet. That's one way. Other way, when we did our 1200 spectra, the Indo-US library, what was done is we spread the observations over several days. Or rather, actually, in fact, several years and several months. So, what do you do today? You decide to observe the CCD was three thousand pixels, so fifteen hundred angstroms, lambda one to lambda two. Suppose fifteen hundred. So, I want to observe from four thousand to fifty-five hundred today. And tomorrow, I will observe from fifty-five hundred to the next fifteen hundred, which will make me to seven thousand. So, we split it like that so that we don't compromise on resolution, but we make many many observations. But The biggest difficulty is there. Today's night and tomorrow's night may not be same, so you will have to suffer that. So yes, these things are very involved, and a lot of people have gone through this. That's why it took us so many years to develop this lab. Uh, if anybody wants to ask on chat or otherwise, you can raise your hand. I can unmute you, but not too many questions. It's already thirty-seven now, so. Anybody has question? Yeah, Ayush has asked. So let me see if I can. So you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Hello, sir. Am I audible? Yeah. Yes, sir. So far, what I have understood from your lecture and the previous lectures on the astrophysics, so what I came to know is that the spectrum and the knowledge of the uh, luminosity, whatever we are gathering from the various telescopes. So For the different galaxies or the stars or the clusters, these are the main basic fundamental things that require to calculate the mass, radius, distance, and other physical parameters for the celestial body. So uh, the question what you asked clearly shows that the definition of luminosity in three different places is quite different, and that's why the confusion is there. When I said luminosity of a star, that was also L, unfortunately. Talks about the total light coming out. Spectral classification has a luminosity which is related to the dips of the absorption features, and this L which was talked today is the throughput of the instrument. So all the three Ls are coming under my two lectures, but they are absolutely different applications, and that's why it becomes confusing. So uh, you can take the measurement of the absorption dips and Do a extensive calculation with the equivalent width and get the number of atoms in your line of sight, etc. Okay, that is one way of uh, doing this uh, stratoscope. The other thing is about the luminosity of the instrument or the throughput. How best can you design an instrument and a given telescope and some faint object? That is a challenge, and that's why this L cross R and all that was discussed. And the first time when we talked about L. Was the total output of the star, that is the Stefan's Boltzmann law. So I think I have clarified the three again, but you will have to read more uh, from the references. So these are the three basic things that uh, you need to find all the parameters related to the stars and galaxies. So when you say parameter, it depends what you want to study. See, a person in working in galaxy may not be interested in these things. He is interested only he or she is interested in the galaxy rotation. So they will take. Uh, Doppler shift of a particular line in the galaxy from one end to other, and the whole galaxy itself, and 
that is where the Doppler shift measurement will be important. So this person may not be interested in knowing the, uh, the, the luminosity of the galaxy. So they're all, it depends where you are uh, working in what part of this. What my two lectures was to just give you the, the basic understanding of these things so that you can apply them when you do research. Next question. Anybody raising a hand or on chat, whichever. I can take one or two more questions. If not, <coughs> then you can pose your questions in the PB works. I checked yesterday's PB works. There was no question from the participants. So I don't know uh, if you have collected your questions and you can send them, post them today. Otherwise, my email ID was also there. You can do that. And uh, I think that's the best way. Then I can answer them uh, later. And as I said, uh, these two lectures, PDFs will be given, in fact, right now after this lecture to the organizer. And you can re request them to share it with you because they will have all your email IDs, etc. And uh, I think the refresher course participants who have to undergo a, a written test, a written meaning online written test, multiple questions, will have at least four questions from my two lectures. So uh, all the information available with the references, you should be able to answer them. I think I will stop here and thank you all for attention and take care and take care of your health. Thank you very much. I will stop here.